Cherish means to love. It means to adore. It means to have a profound devotion to it. It means to take care of it. Hallelujah. It means to consider it special. Cherish the beautiful, the wonderful, and the matchless name of Jesus. I will cherish that beautiful name. Cherish that wonderful name. Cherish that matchless name. That name is Jesus. Lord, I cherish that beautiful name. I cherish that one. Oh, so my my Oh, cherish that matchless Matchless name, that name is Jesus. I want you to sing it. Cherish that beautiful name. Sing it. Cherish that beautiful name. Wonderful name. Cherish that one. Matchless. Cherish that matchless name that name is Jesus Lord I cherish that beautiful name cherish that wonderful name cherish that matchless name that name is Jesus do you really love the name of Jesus Lord I cherish that beautiful name cherish that wonderful name cherish that matchless name that name 
is Jesus. Oh, kings and kingdoms, they will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Everyone say kings and kingdoms, kings and kingdoms, they will all pass away, but there's something about that name, oh, there's just something about that name. There's just something, yes, Shia, something about that name, oh God. There's just something about that name. Give the Lord the praise, those who will, give him glory. Lord, I magnify your name, I glorify your name, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 glory to God, hallelujah, we'll crown him, Lord, and crown him, Lord, and crown him, Shall bow every tongue confess. Oh, come on, so top that Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, praise God. We'll go ahead and close that. Everybody, one more time who has a praise, give it to him. Hallelujah! 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 Wonderful Jesus, Lord, I bless you. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for your name. Thank you for your authority. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for redemption. Thank you for cleansing. Hallelujah. Be glorified in us, we pray. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated if you will. I'm grateful to the Lord that he has made it possible for us to come together for this time of sharing in uh, water baptism. And uh, it is not a light thing. It's a great thing. Uh, it is one of the few things that the Lord commanded us to do as it relates to ordinances and some would say sacraments, it is most definitely one of the two ordinances that the Lord established for his church. And that is the ordinance of the table of the Lord and the ordinance of uh, the um, uh, water baptism, communion, table of the Lord, whichever term you want to use for it. He commanded this. He said, do it as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And then when it comes to when it comes to the uh, the ordinance of baptism, we do that as an initiation, so to speak, into the uh, kingdom of God and the body of Christ. I don't often use the term initiation, but I think almost all of us are familiar with various groups, various organizations, and they all, almost all of them that I know of, have some initiation system, some 
initiation ceremony, so to speak, and a series of ceremonies and activities. Uh, the, some of the best known in our areas would be some of the orders such as Masons and Eastern Stars and others that are known in our area, sororities and fraternities. All of these have their initiation rights. But even in government, when the president or the various other officers are sworn in, you've heard that expression, sworn in, that's an initiation. That's an initiation. Uh, well, among the many things that water baptism is, it is an initiation into uh, the kingdom of God, into the body of Jesus Christ. And so I want to commend those of you who have come to be baptized. Now, um, I would like to, I would like to um, say to you that there are certain things that are prerequisite for baptism. One of them is that it has to be your choice. It has to be your decision. So if in any wise um, someone has constrained you, forced you, coerced, compelled you to do this, it won't take. In other words, you'll get wet, but that's all. If you go through with it, you get wet. That, that's all. But, but you won't get the blessing that, that God intended for baptism to be. So if, if either of you or any of you are here because someone told you you better get baptized or else, um, then um, go ahead with else because it won't do you any good. It has to be your choice. God doesn't force people to love him or to serve him. He really doesn't. And love can't be forced anyway. Love has to be a choice. Now, we can grow in love, and we should, but we have to open our hearts to it. It has to be our decision. That's my point. And so those of you that are sitting here, is it your decision to be a part of this baptismal service? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All right. That's, that's prerequisite number one. Thank God. It has to be your will. Uh, the second prerequisite is not always stated, but it's, it's, it's obvious, but I'm going to state it anyway. And that is, secondly, you have to believe on Jesus. That is, I said believe on him. That might sound a little strange. You have to believe that Jesus is who the Bible says that he is, who he claimed to be. You know, and who he claimed to be is God in human flesh. God having become a human being in order to live and experience what we experience. It was so kind of him to do that. You know, he didn't have to do that. God doesn't have to do anything. Not one thing does God have to do. And yet he chose to become one of us. It's almost not, this is not a good illustration, but my illustrations today, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe my illustrator needs a, a, a reboot. I, I've been giving illustrations today. I think they work, but I, I haven't been impressed with them <laughs> but so much. Uh, I keep thinking there ought to be a better one than that, but, but, but hopefully. Uh, have you ever seen an ant? Never seen an ant, uh, ant hill? Seen ants running, going, okay. Have you ever thought about the comparison of your stature to the stature of an ant, how much bigger you are, and, and of course, as humans in general are to ants, and uh, I don't know if you all ladies, um, but as a fellow, I used to kind of mess with them. You know, I'd put something in the way, like if they were going in a certain direction, i put something in the way and just see what they'd do, whether they're going to go around it or go over it or, you understand? And uh, uh, just aggravate them, I guess. But, but you understand, uh, and, and really trying to study their behavior. I, I didn't know it. I was an amateur scientist, you understand, trying to study their behavior. And, um, uh, but, but I thought about the fact that they didn't know what was going on around them. You know, they're, they're, they're moving a crumb of bread. Or they're, they're moving in a line. or they're, They don't know. Even the 
this thing that was put in front of them. They have no idea. I chose to do it. My hand did it. I, I, I'm just so much bigger than they are, have so much more ability than they have, and they don't even know what's happening. They, they see this thing, boom, come down in front of them. They try to go around, come up, and I put it where they tried to go again, just making their lives miserable in some cases. They had no idea that there's this huge thing that's doing this to them intentionally. Okay. God, in comparison to us, is almost like a human being in comparison to the ant in terms of how great and how powerful he is, except that that human would have to be a billion times bigger and stronger and wiser and the ant would still be the ant. That would be God in comparison to us. Okay, now here's the thing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the ant, I'm watching his behavior, and I'm thinking about the fact that he has no idea what's going on. Suppose I could take on ant status and ant stature. Ant stature, I could become his size and his kind. Ant status, that is, I have the same kind of means of communication that he has with antennae and all that kind of thing. And all of a sudden now, instead of being infinitely above him or her or it, I'm on his or her level. And I'm able to relate. And I'm able to feel like an ant. Most of us have never felt like an ant. Most of us have never felt like an ant. We don't even know how ants feel. Well, God is God. And he knows everything. And so God knew how humans felt without being human because he knows everything. But to know it from the experience of being one, he never had that. Are you listening? And so he became, as it were, an ant. That, that, in, in comparison, in comparison. He became he became one of his creatures, as it were. He became as though he were one of the creatures. And, and I was thinking just this morning about the fact that as God, God has no needs. But as a man, he became needed. He needed a mother. Mm -hmm. He needed somebody to feed him and clothe him and all. A human need. He, he went through that not having. Listen, he invented that. He invented motherhood. He designed the womb. He engineered all of that stuff. And then he subjected himself to it. He subjected himself. He decided to need what he himself had created. And, uh, but I was thinking about the fact that he, he had needs, you know. He got hungry. He got thirsty. He got tired. Where I was really thinking of, uh, of it was uh, in the place of, of this week that is called Holy Week. When Jesus went to the garden to pray. I don't know if you know that story. You know that story about Jesus going to the garden to pray? Good. I'm glad to hear it. You know it? It's all right if you don't. I mean, I, I won't zap you or anything. You, you don't know. Well, Jesus, the, the night in which he was betrayed, he went to the garden to pray about it. And um, you know, he had a great relationship with his father, the father God, and he apparently thought that there is at least the possibility of getting out of having to die on the cross for the sins of the world. The reason why I say that is because he asked the father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. So apparently as a man, he was hoping that there was a way to get out of having to go through all that terrible stuff that he had to go through. See, that's human. That's human. As God, God already knew everything that was good. But as a man, he was saying, if there's a way to do it differently, I don't want to disobey. I, I will not disobey. But if there's another way to do it, that, that's the way we humans think about things, right? We want to take the, the less painful route if we can. Yeah, the, the less challenging route if we can. And... Uh, he asked his disciples to watch with him while he prayed, his inner circle. And here's the thing, and I, I, I've got to meditate on it further, but it's been with me since earlier this week, maybe last week, definitely this week though. The Bible says that he got into prayer, and he prayed, it seems about three hours, but he prayed in, in hour increments 
But when he prayed, he told his disciples, he said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful. He says, I'm really hurting. Jesus, Jesus was really hurting. We think about God, he don't need nothing. He don't, no, but as a man, he told them, I'm really low. I'm really low. He said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful. He says, so in other words, this is not a regular kind of sadness. I'm really, really sad here. He said, even unto death. He said, I'm so sad that I feel as if I could pass away. He said, watch here uh, and, and, and while I go and pray yonder. And the Bible says he began to pray and the scripture says that an angel appeared from heaven. Listen to what it says, strengthening him. And uh, the meditation is, I wonder what kind of strength that was. I wonder what that means. I wonder what that means. I wonder what that means. An angel appeared from heaven. I got that part. Strengthening him. What did the angel do? Did the angel touch him? Did the angel speak to him? What did the angel do? I wasn't there and you weren't there either. There's some clues in scripture, but, but we really don't know. But here's the thing. As a man, he needed strength. That means that as a human being, he was weak. God, isn't that something? As a human being, he was weak. As a human being, he had limitation. And some people don't think about Jesus in those terms. They always think of him as the fellow on the stained glass with his fingers up and all that kind of thing. But as a human being, he became weak. Thank God that although he was weak, he didn't quit. And I'll tell you this ultimately about the angel. Like I said, I, don't, I wasn't there. I don't know exactly what the angel did. I do know this. I know that whatever strength the angel gave him was not angel strength. The angel was a carrier of God's strength. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The angel came to deliver what the father had sent. And the power that the father gave him was so strong that when he got up from praying the last time, he found his disciples sleeping again. He said, go ahead and sleep. I don't need you. Ain't so many words. Right? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm strong enough now. I can handle it on my own. I don't need any moral support. Anybody rooting for me. That's all right. Sleep on now, he said, and take your rest. And he let them sleep on and on and on until he saw Judas and his crowd coming. He said, okay, you got to get up. Let's be going. My, my betrayer is at hand. Isn't that something? Oh, man, you ought to come for all of that. But, 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 but here's the point. Here's the point. Well, you did actually, but, but here's the point. Jesus became human so that not only would he know as God how we feel, but he knows as a man how we feel. Because he became one of us. Isn't that beautiful? And he became one of us so that he could show us that even in weakness, even in limitation, even in lack, you can still retain and maintain a right relationship with God. He's our example. That, that, that's, the, that's the point of this little talk. He's our example. He became our example. He became our example. And you know what? In part of that example, the, one of the first things he did at the beginning of his public ministry and public life is that he was baptized. He was baptized. The only human being who never needed to be baptized was. You hear me? Because baptism has to do with washing away sin. He had no sin to wash away. The only person who never needed baptism, he goes and tells a sinner who does need baptism, baptize me. When I say a sinner, I mean someone who's born in sin. He wasn't living a sinful life, John the Baptist. But 
but compared to Jesus, he, he's, he's born in sin. And yet Jesus said to his creature, baptize me. The creature baptized the creator. Isn't that something? Now you know there's no reason for us to be arrogant and proud when the creator allowed his creation to baptize him. My, my, my. Isn't that something? Wow. It's almost like you, you learn, you, you become a, a, a great engineer, you learn AI. You, you've heard all about AI these days mm, the, and the robots and all that kind of thing. You build a robot, okay, and let the robot drive you down the street. The robot you built. You understand? That's, that's the creator submitting to the hands of the creature. Jesus created John the Baptist. Jesus purposed John the Baptist. Jesus put John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb <laughs> and then allowed John the Baptist that he created to baptize him. Is that awesome? Yes, it is. Why did he do it? To be our example. To demonstrate humility and obedience and other things, but those are the key things. He was baptized. So why should I be baptized? Why should I? That's actually a different item from the first item that I gave. The first item that I gave was prerequisites. First prerequisite is that you've got to choose this, decide. It's your decision. Secondly, you've got to believe that Jesus is who he said he was and is. That is, he was and is God, but he became a man to show us how a human being ought to live in right relationship to God. That's the first reason. And then the second reason, to die in our stead, live, die, and rise in our stead so that the guilt and all that belonged to us, he took it and took it out of the way. Can't condemn us anymore. Okay, yeah, that's why I can't be our example. Uh, in fact, we can say it this way, to be, uh, yeah, it'll be okay. I say it this way, to be our example and to be our expiation. Expiation means the one who clears the way for the wrath of God. He moves the wrath of God. He takes it out of the way. God is at peace with us because of Jesus. That's good, isn't it? Yes, it is. All right. So, you must believe then that what the Bible says about Jesus is true. That he came, lived perfectly, died, was buried, stayed dead three days and nights, and then rose from the dead. Rose, a man got back up from the dead. It wasn't just a spirit. That's why he told Thomas, look at my hands. I got the same holes in them, the same holes in my, in my feet and the hole in my side where they killed me. This is, it's really me. I'm back. He said, you've got to believe that now. To be baptized first, you've got to do what? You've got to be willing. It's got to be your choice. Secondly, you've got to believe what the Bible says about Jesus. I tried to give you a little summary about what it says about Jesus. Third prerequisite is that you must repent for your sin. Okay? You've got to repent for your sin. All of us have sinned. All of, everybody in this building and everybody everywhere else has disobeyed God at some point. To sin, basically, to disobey God displease God and all of us have but the Bible teaches us that when we put our faith in Jesus we'll go back to that second prerequisite when we believe that what the Bible says about Jesus is true then we are able to ask him to forgive us of our sins and when we ask for forgiveness that's really not when he forgives us. That's when it goes into effect in our lives. But when Jesus died, hallelujah, just before he closed his eyes and, and, and went on, he said, it is finished. God forgave you when Jesus died and was buried and rose. He forgave you then. But you don't get the benefit until you personally submit yourself to him. So in other words, you're not waiting on God to forgive you. 
you know, God, please God. No, no, no. He, he really already has. But it's not applied to your life until you ask, until you submit to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so that's where repentance comes in. I know I've done wrong. I know that there are things I did that I shouldn't have done and things that I didn't do that I should have done. But I'm asking you to forgive me. And I know you will because you've told us in your word that if I would come to you, you wouldn't cast me out. You wouldn't cast me aside. Does that make sense? I'm going to read something from the scripture, but I want to make sure that I kind of walk through uh, uh, a, a fairly simple approach to it because I don't, not because you're not intelligent or sophisticated, not at all. I just want to be sure that you understood what it is that you're about to undertake. Does that make sense? Yeah, different age groups, different backgrounds. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page with regard to why we're doing what we're doing. And it's not just you on this row here. It's all of us who need to be clear because there's some of us that have years and everything else, but we still don't have clarity as to what salvation has to do with. Well, when you get baptized, let's talk about some effects. I talked about prerequisite, uh, and I started talking about what you must believe about Jesus but, but let's talk a little bit about outcomes or effects. The first thing that the Bible says is in the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Media, can we get the scripture up? If not, it's all right because uh, it's still written in the Bible. It's the book of Acts chapter 2 and it's verse 38. Um, and as a matter of fact, as we go to, oh, that's right, Sister Taj, you out here. You can't be both places. That's fine. That's fine. We'll, we'll read it. Uh, Acts chapter 2. You have your Bibles, some of you, phone, others of you. And uh, not only that, but uh, let's do Mark as well. Mark 16. Let's go to Mark 16. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 16 and uh, verse 15 and then Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And we'll look at 37, 38. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Let's look at what that says. It says, and he, that is Jesus, said unto them, that is the apostles and the other disciples, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, that is the good news of Jesus Christ, to every creature, every person, every human. Verse 16, His, verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Baptism is for salvation. Baptism has to do with salvation. Being saved from the wrath of God, saved from eternal judgment, saved from having to go to hell, saved from being separated from God, saved from the power of Satan, saved from the power of sin. Baptism has to do with all of that. And let's do, I, I did a lot of save froms, right? Okay, now let's go further. Save for the fulfillment of God's purpose for your life. He doesn't just save you from, he saves you for. That makes it, you know, you all look so, so happy about all of this, but I'm, I'm, I'm just picking. All right, but listen, listen, I'm going to tell you again, he saves you for, in other words, you know, you already know that you've got talents, you've got abilities, you've got interests, you've got curiosities. Those things came from God in their purity. That's right. You've got passion, you've got desire to help this people, uh, lift this group of people, serve this group of people some kind of way, build something, draw something, write something, sing something. You have that in you that came from God. The Bible tells us in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from God. Comes from God. You got it from God. All right? So, every good gift, every perfect gift comes from God. However, you won't be able to perfect that good gift until you give yourself back to him. So, I want to be uh, an engineer like you were talking about with the AI and all that. Great. That came from God. AI itself comes from God. People can twist it and make it evil, but the gift itself, the knowledge itself, the skill, that came from God. Couldn't have come from anybody else. The devil, he can't invent anything good. 
He got his smarts from God. You follow what I'm saying? The Bible says God made him wise in his origin. Every good gift comes from God. I, I wish I could preach that all over the world. Every good gift comes from God. Because people think, I don't know, they think they created it themselves and then some think the devil gave them certain things. He'll lie to them. He'll tell them, serve me and I'll make you a blankety blank. Yeah, all he's doing is stealing what belongs to God and, and what belongs to you anyway. He's not a creator. He was created himself. You understand what I'm saying? The only thing he can do is take what God created and twist it. Pervert it. You follow that? So you are not just saved from, you're also saved for. If I had time, I would go down maybe and interview each of you quickly about what your interests are, what your career is or what your career is going to be, what your profession is or what your profession is going to be, what your life calling is or what your life calling is going to be. You may already know. You may not be sure yet. You may have certain interests, certain clues. I'm sure you have clues. God always gives us clues. He gives us breadcrumbs, so to speak, to follow on our way, you know, to discover it. So in order for you to fulfill that the way he intended it, you need to be saved. So he doesn't just save you from. That's the side that's been preached. He saves you for. Thank you, Lord. Because you cannot become the you that he ordained you to be without salvation. You know, last Sunday we were talking about it. You know, I don't know, any of you here last Sunday by chance? Any of you? Okay, well, I see two. Okay, fine. Uh, last Sunday we mentioned Sister Latifah Smith. Uh, she was sitting in this section about one, two, three, four, about the fourth row. She uh, is going to be an anesthesiologist. She's going to be a doctor, okay, some kind of doctor. And, uh, and, and I think she is a doctor, but anyway, she's doing her residency at Chapel Hill, in UNC Chapel Hill, the, the hospital. That's wonderful. You know what? God, when he saved her, he didn't just save her from her sins. He saved her for the practice of medicine. See, he's the one who put those concerns in her for helping those who are sick and helping those who are in need and so on and so forth. He put that in her. Now, she can be a doctor without being saved, true, but she can't be the kind of doctor that God intended her to be. Hallelujah. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> You, you can be some things without salvation, but you can't be the thing the way God intended you to be without being saved. Because salvation doesn't just save you from sin, it saves you for God's eternal purpose. Man, I wish I could tell people that. They don't, you know, I was looking at the fellows. My wife uh, is a basketball fan. Uh, I am not. I am a fan of basketball players, if I know them. You understand what I'm saying? So I enjoy them. I don't enjoy the game. I don't have to ever see another basketball. It won't do a thing to me. If I never see another basketball game, it won't do a thing. And that, that's all right. nothing wrong with it. Now, listen, nothing wrong with it. It's wonderful. It's just not my thing, okay? Because uh, on the other hand, I, I, you know, music is, is one of my things. So, all right. So anyway, um, but she, was, she was, had it on, and so I figured since she had it on, I wouldn't change the channel. I thought about it, but I didn't yield. I went ahead and left it where it was. And, uh, and so watching it, since I've watched a few games, I got a little interested in it. And uh, Houston and Duke, or Duke and Houston, whichever order you want to put it in, were playing last night. And uh, we were watching those fellas doing what they do. And, of course, uh, it appeared, uh, Duke won, didn't they? Yeah, by a by, by, by very small margin, but they won. That's all the people want to know. They won. Well, listen, those abilities that those young men have, those abilities come from God. They come from God. I heard the coach say, thank God, I think one time, real quick, but I thought I heard him say, thank God, one time. But uh, all of that comes from God. That height comes from God. That speed comes from God. That uh, manual dexterity, the nimbleness of movement, all of that comes from God. So when I say God's purpose, I'm not just talking about wearing a robe like this one, okay? That, that's not all God calls people to do. Now, he does call people to do this, but that's not all he calls us to do. You follow that? 
I'm telling you that every one of you under the sound of my voice, there is a God purpose. Now, it may or may not be college basketball, but there is a God gift. And too many people are living miserable lives because, number one, they don't know that there's a gifting in them. And number two, if they know they have it, they don't know it comes from God. They think it's just some fluke of fate. But I'm telling you that you have in you God stuff, God residue, God light that he intends to bring forth to a greater degree, a greater scale. I know the two of you are musical. Mm -hmm. Now the other three of you, I don't know your abilities, but I know you have them. Well, God put these things in there. And part of him saving you is so that that thing can become what he ordained. He doesn't just save people for Sunday morning. He doesn't just save people for singing and shouting. And, the, and God knows we believe in that. No, he saved you for wholeness. Jesus Christ makes you whole. Thank you. He's not just the Lord of your Sunday. He's the Lord of your Monday through Saturday as well. And so when he saves you, he's saving you not only from, he's saving you for. That makes sense? So Mark chapter 16, verse 16 said, he that believeth and is baptized, that's why we're going to the water, shall be saved. Saved from sin, evil, wickedness, Envy, strife, fear, hatred, bigotry, racism, sexism, classism, ageism, and all the other negative isms. Saved from it, but then also saved for. Hmm. This is good. Let me tell you why it's good. Because the enemy will try to steal your destiny from you. He'll try to steal, he'll try to derail you from your divine purpose. He'll try to so, and here's one of the main ways he does it, he'll try to hurt you so badly that you feel as if, I, I can't possibly achieve that thing. Hurt you even through some, what somebody said to you, what somebody did to you, what somebody didn't do that should have done for you. All those things are designed to shut you down, derail you, get you off course, you don't fulfill purpose. Because he knows that when you fulfill your purpose, it's going to damage his kingdom. Say now, we're going to tear your kingdom down. Okay, listen, listen, listen. When you, when you do what God called you to do, it's going to tear Satan's kingdom down. So that's why he wants to hurt you and, and discourage you and damage you and, and, and wound you and all of the rest because he knows that if you become what God ordained, his kingdom is coming down. I wish I was preaching today. Did you hear what I said to you? I said God intends to use you to tear down the works of Satan. In the book of 1 John chapter 3, I believe it's verse 7 or verse 8, but it says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Well, when you get born again, when you get saved, you become a son of God. And the purpose is the same, destroy the works of the devil. All right, I'm almost done. Uh, Mark 16, 15 says, uh, 16 rather, he that believeth is baptized shall be saved. So baptism has to do with salvation, saved from, saved for. Then Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 38. Acts chapter 2 and uh, verse 7 and verse 37 rather and verse 38. These are some classic verses pertaining to water baptism. It says, uh, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. That means that the word had impact on their lives. They were disturbed in their spirits 
they were disturbed in their souls and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? In response to what you told us, what shall we do? What should we do? Tell me, what, how do I respond? What's the action plan? Peter said, here it is. Then Peter said to them, repent. Repent. The word repent here means to change your mind. The Old Testament term for repent means to turn. Put it together, it means that you're going to change your mind and go in another direction. Right? He says repent, and what else does it say? And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for what purpose? For the remission of sins. So salvation and removing of sin. Baptism pertains to these things. One other item pertaining to this. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Yes, Lord, I thank you. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And that goes back to what I said earlier. God has already forgiven us because he has forgiven, he has forgiven all sin. Legally, God has forgiven all sin. But the fact that he's forgiven all sin, oh, he forgave them all? Okay, I'll just go ahead and do what I want to do because they're already forgiven. That means, that means you have not appropriated his forgiveness yet because when you appropriate it, it's going to change your heart toward sin. See, it's not just the legal, it's also the, the supernatural element, and they're both supernatural, but it's not just justification, he's legally forgiven you, but also sanctification has begun, he's begun to transform you from the inside. There's a pricking of the heart. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2 says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. This is verse 3. This is the one I want to get to, 3 and 4. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in nearness of life. Or say it another way. Baptism is not only for salvation from sin, and for purpose, baptism is also for identification. You become identified with Jesus Christ. I said you become identified with Jesus Christ. This is another element that's not talked about enough. All right? Uh, what do you mean identified with him? I mean that in the realm of God, in the realm of the spirit, you have his, you share his identity. You share his identity. You are recognized as him or as a part of him. I saw Brother Phillips earlier, he stepped up. Uh, married couple. Any, any married couples? Any, any married couple? Okay, good. Okay. Uh, the two of you. What is your name, sir? Uh, Andre. All right. And, and, and what's your last name? Shaw. Okay. You Mrs. Shaw? Okay. What's your first name? Cartesia. Andre and Cartesia Shaw. All right. You all are married. That means you got married sometime in the past, right? You weren't born married. All right, okay. okay. Um, I'm, I'm just picking on you a little bit, you know, because some people, uh, some people need a little wake up right through here. Um, how long have you been married? Six years, bless your heart. So that's what, um, 2018 or so? 2018. Um, uh, you got married somewhere, right? Uh, just, just, just for reference, was it in a church setting or 
uh, church. Okay, all right. Most churches have an aisle. It might not be a long aisle, but most of them have an aisle. A A I L A I S L E, an aisle, like one of these walkways. Okay, Katisha, Cartisha, Cartisha. What, what's your other? What's your maiden name? Cartisha Brown. Uh, there came a time when you, Brother Andre Shaw, if, if it happened the traditional way, you can do it all kind of way. You know, people come dancing down the aisles and all. The brothers do all kind of things now. But, but if it was the old-fashioned kind, you and the preacher and the best man came out of a corner somewhere and stood and waited on Sister Cartisha Brown to come down the aisle in all her splendor, okay? So Sister Cartisha came down after all the, you know, all the other people came, she was last because she's the center of the track. She came down the aisle. Well, now, she came down that aisle, or came up the aisle, maybe you want to say it that way. She came up the aisle, Cartesia Brown, standing beside Andre Shaw. But by the time the two of you pledged before God, and pledged to one another and vowed to God and vowed to one another and the preacher being duly deputized by heaven and by the state pronounced you husband and wife and you got this uh, license that you got from the uh, county that says that you're husband and wife and all of that you came up Cartesia Brown okay and Andre Shaw but when you left you left Mr. and Mrs. Andre Shaw her name doesn't have to be called, but she is legally identified with you as you. Everybody else, even your mother, now I know you love mama, and your dad and whoever else, everybody else who is close to you, closest to you, have got to take a step to the side because now Mrs. Cartesia Shaw is identified with you as you in a way that nobody else is. And everything that belongs to you now belongs to her as well. That's what happens when you get baptized into the name of Jesus. It means that you are now Mrs. Jesus, if I can use that expression, okay? Everything that belongs to him belongs to you. Are you listening to me? And nobody can respect Brother Andre and not respect Sister Cartesia. Mm -mm. You can't, you can't, they're a package deal. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. When you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and when we seal this in water baptism, no devil can respect Jesus and not respect you. He got to respect you too. Because Jesus said, Behold, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power. Then you are identified with Christ. Water baptism is in effect the same as a uh, not a wedding ceremony, but a wedding ceremony is a covenant ceremony. Well, so is water baptism. It's a covenant ceremony. Does that make sense? You are identified with Jesus Christ. So when you get baptized in name, that doesn't just mean, well, I had a ceremony, and in that ceremony they call the name of Jesus. No, it means you carry the name. When you show up, the name shows up. When you show up, his authority is power. Shows up. So, so, you know, things is often said about second separation of church and state and it's a time and a place for all things listen if you let me in you just let Jesus in Amen. hallelujah if you let me speak Jesus is speaking so he can't read the Bible I'm walking the Bible I'm living the Bible you understand what I'm saying there so they can't keep him out if they let me in because I'm identified with him water baptism for the remission of sin and for identification with Jesus Christ if you are willing to do this and you believe that the word is right concerning what Jesus said and you have repented of your sins, then you are ready to receive this remission of sin and identification with Jesus Christ. You got the outline? Come on. The first prerequisite is that you came willingly. Secondly, you believe what the Bible says about Jesus, that he is who the Bible says he is. Got it? And thirdly, because you believe it, you're willing to repent because you realize that whereas he was in right relationship with God, you were not, but you want to be. And he can put you there, right? And so I'm going to be baptized because in doing so, he removes my sin and he identifies me with himself. I think that's good. How about you? Everybody praise him for it if you, 
if you agree. Let's just finish the 38th verse. It says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And the rest of that verse says, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I'm talking about Acts 2.38. He says, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you, my dear friend, the reason why you've got to be willing and the reason why you've got to believe and you've got to ask me all of that is because something happens on the inside when you come to Jesus. It's not just dunking you in water. You can get that at the swimming pool or at your bathtub or what have you. Hallelujah. But something supernatural, when you put your faith, when you say, God, I want you. I want you more than I want anything else. I've got to have you. Your name is Jesus. Well, Jesus, I've got to have you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are the one and only true and living God. I believe that you came to the earth as a man and that you lived, that you died, and that you were buried and you rose again. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin, cleanse me of my sin, and make me what you'd have me to be. You sent me to the world with a purpose. I want to do your will. I want to serve you. I want to walk up right before you. I want to have a light that will shine that men and women will know that God is real. Thank you for it. Praise you for it. Hallelujah. And Father, I thank you that you promised me that if I would obey you in this water baptism, that I would receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, some of you may have already received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Stand on it. Stand on it. Stand on that reception. Stand. But if you have not yet received the gift of the Holy Ghost, believe him that he's going to keep his word. Hallelujah. To be filled with the Holy Ghost means that God himself comes to live inside you personally. I said he comes to live inside you personally. My, my. Isn't that good? You don't have to wonder about him leaving you or forsaking you. He is the only one who will be with you always, even to the end of the world. Have you understood what I've attempted to, to say to you tonight? All right, then. Uh, Father, thank you for these young people. Thank you for your hand upon their lives. Thank you for the privilege of sharing with them, but not only with them, but sharing with all who are part of this congregation in person and those who are streaming with us as well. Because, Lord, there are countless thousands, even millions, who need to make the same decision that these young people have made. Hallelujah. To be baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ. Fulfilling the prerequisites of not being forced to do it, but choosing to do it. Hallelujah. Believing what your word said about Jesus. And then because they believe faith without works is dead, they put their works in repenting and obeying you. And you promise that if we come to you, you won't cast us out. I give you praise for it now. Lord, any of them that have not yet received the gift of the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, as hands are laid on them in baptism and beyond, let them be filled with the Holy Ghost. And I give you praise in Jesus' name. Everybody, let's praise him together now. Praise him together. That's a weak one. That's weak, church. Come on, praise him like you mean it. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Someone says, well, that brother blue, do it take that long to explain baptism. Well, it actually takes longer than that. But, but here's, here's the thing. If there were 30 of them or 50 of them, I want to make sure that this group understands that your being baptized today is just as significant if the numbers were a, a lot larger, a, a much larger number because God deals with us one by one. Now, don't get me wrong. He sees us as, he sees, oh, all right, I was wondering what happened. Uh, he sees us as his body, but he also sees us one by one. And he saves us one by one. Your one baptism is just as significant as 50 or 100 or what have you. And, and let me explain why, okay? God, God wants 
numbers. Yeah, he believes in numbers. That's not the point. But, but um, in the eighth chapter of the book of Acts, one man uh, is baptized by Philip. Philip had been baptizing crowds of people in Samaria, and God told him, leave there and go out here on the Gaza Road, and uh, I got something for you. Well, he got there, and a black man, high-ranking government official, uh, is on his way back home. And uh, uh, Philip, God says, he's the one I want you to talk to. Make a long story short, that fellow's reading the Bible, the book of Isaiah chapter 53, and doesn't understand it. God uses Philip to explain it to him, just as we've attempted to explain today. And when they pass by a body of water, that black man said to Philip, see, here is water. What does hinder me from being baptized? He was believing. On, he said, this is what Philip said to him. He said, if you believe with all your heart, see, that's, that's what I've been trying to convince you about today. He said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. Listen to what that man said. He said, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. Hallelujah. You believe that? Well, uh, when Philip heard him say that, they stopped and, and Philip baptized. One man. But ch church history tells us that one man took the gospel to his nation. The nation being Ethiopia or something like that. To, uh, one man. See, that one baptism looked like just one person. That, it affected a whole nation. I don't know where God's going to send you. I don't know how God's going to use you. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go to the next chapter. That's chapter 9, right? Acts chapter 9. And uh, there, there's a fellow on the road to Damascus who hates the church and hates Christians. And Jesus gets a hold of him and tells him, go on to Damascus and there it will be told you what you must do. And the scripture says that in the meanwhile, God spoke to a man named Ananias and said, I want you to go to him I want you to lay your hands on him that he might receive his sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. This man's name, as we know him, is Paul. And when Paul gives his testimony in chapter 22 of Acts, he said not only did he lay hands on him and he received his sight, not only did he receive the Holy Ghost, but Ananias says to Saul, or Paul, now that he's baptized, or now that he's saved, he says, uh, and now for what dost thou wait? Arise! and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Isn't that good? One man. But we've got the Bible, much of the Bible, because of that one man who got baptized. Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, and uh, Philemon and many of us believe Hebrews all because one man got baptized that day the gospel spread throughout the Roman Empire because that one man got baptized that day so, so, uh, so there's no telling what God going to do with Sister Mary and through Sister Mary he did powerful things to another Mary a few years ago Lord they missed it Jesus okay what's your first name says you know I know you Oh, Lord, a name like Destiny. I don't even have to say anything else, right? No telling what God will do through Sister Destiny. First name, Michaela. Well, if you know the word Michael means who is like God, then you know that uh, because it's a derivative of that same meaning. You don't have to wonder about what God will do. What's your name? Madison. 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 Well, this particular fellow is called the, the, the namesake, and it, it goes further back than that. But you know the most famous Madison is probably the one who is called the father of the Constitution, right? In other words, God used him to establish a nation. What did he call us? But ye are, Romans, uh, uh, 1 Peter 2, 9, ye are a chosen generation, royal all your priesthood, holy nation. He says the gospel we preached among all nations. There's no telling what God will do in the life of Sister Madison. What's your first name, please, ma'am? Jacaela. Jacaela. I don't know a thing in the world about the name <laughs> about the name Jacaela. However, however, I just happened to be talking to someone who had a very similar name that was derivative from Jeremiah. And, and, and almost all the names that end in a, uh, whether it's I-A-H or J-A-H or some other similar, that, that um, suffix is 
um, a contraction of God's name in the Bible, Jehovah or Yahweh. Okay? So when you said, Je, what is it? Jehovah, it reminded me, it's not identical, even the Jah part for that matter, both of those. And, and I'm not making this up. Jah and Yah, both are derivative of God's name in the Old Testament, Yahweh or Jehovah. So whatever it means, God is all tied up in it. <laughs> uh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and, and I'll give you one illustration. Um, the name Elijah, Eli or Eli means my God. Je, Jehovah, my God is Jehovah. Okay, so, so um, I, I gave that as an illustration again of the fact, Jeremiah, your name reminded me of, because the young lady I was talking to yesterday, her name was something like Jeremiah or something like that. And um, I, I looked up Jeremiah again just to be sure. And it means appointed of Jehovah, <clears throat> perhaps even established by Jehovah. So I'm, I'm saying that to say that's not just, you know, consolation prize, make her feel good. No, no, no. That Jah part and that Yah part, both of those come from the Hebrew and that's Yahweh, which is the name of God. When God told Moses, I am that I am, he said, Eye, Asher, Eye, or in other words, Yahweh, or Yahweh, or Jehovah, or your name got him all tied up in it. That makes sense? All right, then. Well, we're going to uh, administer water baptism uh, to you. I want you to go praying. I want you to be in the line, and then when you come down, praying, Lord, do something in my life especially. And I'll tell you this. Now, I don't remember for sure. I can't tell you for sure as I thought about it. I can't tell you for sure. But the day I was baptized, I can't tell you how many people were baptized when I was. I, I can't tell you. That the first, actually, it's a long story. But when I was baptized at age three, the Lord led me to be baptized. The Lord. I look at three-year-olds now, and I find it difficult to believe. But I was mean, so I know it happened. But three years old, the Lord just started dealing with me about being baptized. And, and, and again, cutting it short, that day I was baptized. I don't know if there anybody else was be, being baptized that day. Okay? But let's say there was not one but that one. I was baptized in a, um, an outfit that included what, the, the, you know, when they put babies in those pajamas that have feet in them, you know, it closes them in, zip them up. I was in a white set of them. I don't know what it was supposed to prove, but, you know, but I was... You know, there was a robe made for me. I don't remember whether I ever got the robe on or not, but, but, but anyway, here's the point. If it was just one, I'm here in 2024, uh, 57 years later, to talk to Mary and Destiny and Michaela and Madison and Ja Kayla about God's purpose for their lives. So out of one, God gets at least five. Isn't that good? You don't know who he's going to use you to touch. You don't know who he's going to use you to bless. And so we will not make light of this. Believe God for great things. All right, we've already prayed. Uh, those who are going to assist them, you may lead them now to the area <clears throat> to be in line. The rest of us, please be prayerful and, and, and rejoice with them and with us. To worship you, O oh my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, and let it be a sweet 
sweet sound in your ear. Glory to God. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship. Take joy, my King, in what you hear, and let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Sing, I love you, Lord.
Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory. Hallelujah. The praise. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. Take your time. Glory. You're worthy of the praise. Thank you, Lord. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yes. Did you come for the same reason your sister did? You said that to be closer to God is that is that your? Well, let me ask, just speak for yourself. Why, why have you come to be there to be baptized? Mm -hmm. And to know Him for yourself. That's good. Glory. That's Thank wonderful. You, Lord. He receives that. Thank you, Jesus. Do you believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. And have you repented to Him for your sins? Yes. Then, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in obedience to his commandment, we baptize you with water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and for identification with him. And you shall be filled, hallelujah, with the Holy Ghost. Hold your breath. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Take your time. Thank you, Lord. Sister Destiny, uh, why have you uh, decided to be baptized? Cast your cares on him. Oh, that's good. Sister Destiny, do you believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. And have you repented to him of all your sins? Yes. Upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and in obedience to his commandment, we baptize you in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin and for identification with him. You shall be filled and refilled with the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, with him. Hallelujah. You, you shall Thank be filled you. and refilled Thank with the Holy Ghost. Hold your breath. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hey, that's it. Oh, Thank you. Thanksgiving praise for these that have come to dedicate their lives. 
high-ranking government official was in the number. But we believe God because every life counts in the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord. Let's praise him one more time. God bless you. God bless you.
right to God. Lift your hands and give God praise for the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Nothing else cleanses us. Hallelujah. Nothing but the blood that saves us, keeps us, washes us. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Can you just lift your hands and thank God for the name of Jesus and for the blood of Jesus? Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 God, we bless you. We bless you. Hallelujah. Here we are in your presence, lifting holy hands to you.
sister, Ja'Kayla Johnson. God bless you, sister, Ja'Kayla. Yeah. Sister Michaela Phillips. God bless you, sister Phillips. Thank you. Sister Madison Phillips. God bless you. Sister Destiny Genright. God bless you. And Sister Mary, she stepped out for a moment. That's fine. Sister, there she is. Okay. Very good. Sister Mary Holly. is on the certificate. Um, we will get this redone and, and, and given to her. Uh, Sister Mary, stay right there. Let me just read this for the benefit of all to hear. It says, Certificate of Baptism in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior and upon repentance and profession of faith in him, this candidate has this day and the, today's date followed Jesus Christ in obedient observance of the ordinance of water baptism and the likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection. And then Acts 2.38 that we read earlier is inscribed. God bless you. God bless you. As someone has said, this is definitely an appropriate season for water baptism to be administered because what made baptism possible and relevant, Christian baptism, is because of what happened this week nearly 2,000 years ago. And that is that Jesus came and suffered and died and was buried and rose again. And so we thank God for being able to be beneficiaries of what he died to provide. I'm going to ask that we'd all stand at this time. We're going to dismiss you. And uh, I'm going to ask that you would greet one another. Certainly to all of our guests, we're glad for you, all of you who are with us. That's right. Please give a round of applause. To all of the clergy that are here, we honor you. To Pastor Melinda, we honor you. Praise God. I thank uh, media and I thank maintenance. I thank maintenance for setting up um, and, and, and collaborating to get our preparations done. Now again, those who are part of royalty, I think you know that we're supposed to be meeting with them or with you um, uh, at one, those who are part of the children's choir. And, um, and so we ask that you would just uh, prepare your hearts for tomorrow and wherever you are assigned to be in worship, make sure you are there and make sure you're giving God the praise that he deserves. Before you engage in any other activity, make sure that you give God his praise. You know, you can have Easter dinner or uh, whatever, parade, whatever, that's great. But make sure that you always honor God first. Not just first in sequence, but first in significance. Amen. He's not just first on the list. He's the most important thing on the list because were it not for him, there'd be no list. Fathers, we conclude this gathering. We thank you. We thank you for all that has been done and said, and we ask that you cover and keep your people. Take us to our homes and various other destinations safely and bring us back together at the appointed hour that we may give you the glory, honor, and praise. Lord, these young people who have received this ministry, Lord, let their lives be forever changed. Let them be witnesses of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And we give you praise for it now. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Please repeat these words. We are what the word of God says that we are. We have what the word of God says that we have. 
and we can do what the Word of God says that we can do. For we are committed to bring pleasure to Christ's heart and fame to his name. Amen. May the peace of God go with you.